This episode of Free Mind Podcast is brought to you by BioProtein Technology, the makers of BioPro Plus. BioPro Plus is a non synthetic growth hormone alternative. Comes in a little vial, you take it under your tongue each morning, no needles or any messy stuff like that. Packed full of growth factors, all kinds of beneficial stuff. I've been taking it for months and my results have been awesome. Recovered from knee surgery, helped my libido, my energy levels everything. I feel great. Can't recommend it enough. Bioproteintech.com. Use the code FREEMIND, F-R-E-E-M-I-N-D, and get $30 off. Next, JustWorkCo.com, the company that I own that makes these t-shirts. All of the t-shirts that I wear on the show, for the most part, are made by JustWorkCo. You can pick one up there to support the show. We'd really appreciate it. Lastly, First Form, the only supplements that I use, firstform.com slash hurt, H-U-R-T, will get you free priority shipping on anything off the website as long as you're in the continental U.S. I've used First Form supplements for five years, love them, can't say enough good things about them, swear by them, firstform.com slash hurt. My guest today is Mr. Anthony Deal. He is a pro strongman, a husband, a father, and an online coach, and very open about his Christianity on social media and elsewhere, and really enjoyed having a conversation with him about a range of topics. Anyway, without further ado, Anthony Deal. All right, well, let's kick this sucker off, bro. Let's, uh, let's do it. introduce you to the good people, and then we'll jump in. So, let's do it, man. If you want to introduce yourself, that way I don't do you any injustices, and then we'll <laughs> kick it off, brother. Yeah, absolutely. Well, my name is Anthony Deal. I am a former pro middleweight strongman, father, husband to three kids, coach, uh, jiu-jitsu player. So uh, that's me at a 30,000 foot view. I don't, I mean, I'm not that interesting of a person. So, <laughs> but if well, you want to know anything, ask away. I disagree. I think you're an interesting person. So let me just make sure. Okay, cool. My audio is recording. That is the one mistake you don't want to make as a podcaster is get all the way through a conversation and you're like, oh my gosh, we didn't press record. So yeah, man, we've, I've been wanting to do this for a while. We, we've talked about it a couple of times and there was a period when I was, hold on one sec, technical difficulties. There was a period when I was only doing the podcast in person. So I refused to do it over Zoom. Ah, got it. And that's when I originally reached out to you and I was like, I'm going to make my way up to Pennsylvania. We'll have to record. And then of course I finally gave in and decided to start doing zoom a little bit just because, yeah. I mean, if you want to be able to talk to a good number of people, it's just sure. logistical, uh, logistically way better. So anyway, it's, it's an honor to have you, man. Um, there's multiple directions we can take this thing. Obviously kind of my point of this podcast is essentially you know, it's called free mind for a reason. I, I feel, you know, people, people are often taught what to think instead of how to think these days. Yeah. Their, their sovereignty as a human is essentially sacrificed because they're not willing to put in the work at self-discovery, whether it's sure. uh, physical, mental, spiritual um, relationships, etc. And so I like having people on the show who are examples of individuals who are willing to take that look at themselves and their role in the world and how to be yeah. as best they can, right? Whether that's a father, a strong man, a Christian, uh, things like that, which I've, I've really appreciated a lot of your content in that regard. So um, I guess, man, what, let's start this way. What is your take on the state of masculinity in today's America? Oh man. Um, it's garbage. Uh, that's that's a thirty thousand foot view. It's 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 garbage. Um, if we want to discuss why that is, man, we're gonna go all the way back to the seventeen hundreds, maybe even a little bit before that. Um, 
you know, uh, start talking about Mary Wollstonecraft and, you know, the origins of feminism and how that plays in with the industrial revolution and taking men out of the homes and the women's suffrage movement. And man, that conversation alone could be an hours long podcast. So I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but I think um, the state of masculinity is, is weak, but it's a condition that is, is part of man's fallen nature. I mean, Adam in the garden was commissioned to take dominion over the creatures, and he was supposed to steward creation. That idea of taking dominion means to use resources to your advantage. Take Eden and expand it to the world, fill it with loads of people and communities and cultures as a vice regent of God. Lead. That is That was Adam's commission. And immediately... Uh, what does he do? He lets his wife be seduced by the serpent. And instead of stepping in to, to shepherd, guide, and protect, he just goes along with it. And so it's always going to be um, natural to fallen man to not lead, to not step up when he ought. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we're seeing is just the, the outworking of, frankly, it's just sin in our lives. And it's the fact that uh, we refuse out of laziness or whatever the case is um, to step up to that role that we were given and the society we see around us uh, is chaos when we don't do what we're supposed to do as men. What do you think is if, if it's possible, and I guess that's the first part of the question, is it possible to return to, I don't even know when I would say return to because it's been such a, a process. Mm. Do you think there's hope, I guess? Yes. And, it, and if there Absolutely. is, what is the solution for, yeah. for a young man today? Yeah, for sure. Okay, so there's two parts to this because you called out that I'm a Christian and I'm fundamentally a Christian. And so that shapes my worldview. And so naturally I'm going to say and, and believe that ultimately mankind's hope is a right relationship with God, particularly when men Men love to lead, or they say they want to, especially in this world of like self-discipline, Jocko willing, go hard, get it done. We say that, but um, in order to lead, you do have to follow, mm. right? In order to have hierarchy, um, dignity requires hierarchy, right? We say that everybody's dignified. Well, if everybody's dignified, then nothing's dignified. There is hierarchy and that's good. Um, and so if men want to lead, you have to be able to follow. So who are you following? You can't be an end to yourself. So you have to submit yourself to something in order to lead well. And so for me, I would say that young men ought to bow the knee to Christ and follow him and as what he outlines for masculinity, um, proper leadership in the home, get married, have you some kids, disciple them, train them, educate them, teach them, build them up. Um, so that's my Christian answer. Now let's go outside of that and say, okay, what about the listeners who are not Christians? Do I think that men who aren't Christians can do good in the world? Yes, I do. Because I think that God created all men with an understanding of natural law. We understand inherently what is good and right, what is wrong and what is evil. Now, the difference between a, a Christian and a non-Christian is going to be motivations right? So the Christian wants to do these right things to bring glory and honor to God. The person who does not believe in Christ wants to do these things because there is some utilitarian good. It's a good thing when men and societies are harmonious, work together, and we're not killing each other. That's good. So, so I guess I have two answers to that. Absolutely, I think there's hope because I'm a Christian and I've read the end of the book and Jesus wins. Um, and then number, number two, um, I think sometimes when we when we tend to despair, it's because we have a short-sighted view of history. So if we're comparing 2022 America to America in you know 1750, well, sure, it looks like we've come a long way. We've just completely slid off the rails and we're just going over a cliff. And that might be true relative to 1750. Um, but I think sometimes as Americans, we tend to just get a tunnel vision and look at just our culture. What people don't realize right now is especially in regards to Christianity, the Protestant version of Christianity is growing faster in South America right now than it did in Europe during the Reformation period. The church is exploding in China. It's exploding in the Middle East. It's exploding in Ukraine. I've got friends in Ukraine and the churches there are exploding. And so, yeah, I absolutely believe there's hope. Um, and, and again, um, 
naturally as a Christian, I'm going to uh, appeal to people and say, hey, follow Christ. This is this is what you were made and, and created to do. And so that's my ultimate answer and hope. But I also do look at guys like Jocko Willink and Joe Rogan and, um, you know, these other dudes in kind of the conservative manosphere space that are calling young men back to a um, self-discipline. Jordan Peterson, get up and make your bed. Take responsibility for your actions. Um, though our worldviews might diverge when it comes to motive, I still think that is a net good for society. Yeah. So, so yeah, I totally think there's hope. Um, this It's not like this is new. I mean, we're just living the Roman Empire again. Mm. Yeah, I was um, actually going to bring that up. There's sort of this trend that you see through history of especially the confusion about gender and sexuality mm. and everything. It's sort of a, a civilization gets too comfortable you backslide and in your in your ways essentially and and start creating problems because real problems don't exist to an extent i think oh, right? like, yeah we're bored man we're, yeah, we're bored. We, we have life is better than it has ever been this way it kills me when i see like women's marches in the united states like what what rights do you not have oh you want to you want to dissect your babies in utero and decapitate them and you feel like you're being abreast because you can't do that uh, because you need to be a grown ass adult and take responsibilities. And then, so then they'll throw out like the rape and incest, which is like 0.1% of all abortions out there, right? To justify, I'm like, no, 99.99% of abortions occur because y'all are hoes. You can't keep it in your pants. And it's men's fault too, right? Well, it's because, of course, yeah. It's you know, it takes two people, right? To, yeah. so yeah. Um, yeah, we're bored, man. We're bored in America in 2022. We have no problems. Um, you know, my wife and I were laughing last night because uh, the house we live in is a farmhouse and I need to put central air in it. We have these window units. And I took them out for the year. Well, the last like three days, it's been close to 80 degrees. And I'm like, I'm not putting these units back in. So I'm laying there in bed last night. I'm like, it's so hot. I'm thinking, this is such a first world problem. Yeah. Like, Absolutely. what a whiny little bee I'm being right now. <laughs> like, this Dude. is the biggest problem I have in my life is my room is not cool enough for me to sleep comfortably for a yeah. day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Absolutely. And I shared the, this video. You probably saw it. It was this Starbucks worker who was yes. having a, a meltdown because they had to work an eight hour shift. It's like, we really don't have real problems. And right. I think it's this to go back to what you said, the fall of the, the um, empires that came before us, it always sort of ends up this way where there's this cycle, right? You've heard it a million times now, you know, good times create weak men, weak men create hard times, hard times create hard men and hard men create good times and so on and so forth. And it's like, you get wrapped up in that. So I'm always curious, especially as a father. And uh, it's like my, my daughter absolutely, without question has a way better life than I had when I was a kid. Sure. Now, is it it's it's imperative that I somehow though create necessary levels of adversity in her life so that she can be molded into an individual strong enough to go out into the world and take it on instead of getting slapped in the face and making a video crying at Starbucks because she has to work 8 hours, right? Right. So, that's a a real big internal battle that I have as a parent and I was actually talking to my wife about it last night and and i'm curious how do you see your role as a parent in terms of grappling with that right like how do you create enough challenge enough struggle enough adversity right yeah. or you are a parent right i'm sorry oh, yeah. i've got three kids so, okay that's right uh, nine yeah, so. nine uh almost eight and six yeah so a couple things one that you care is perfect like that's great because a lot of people just don't care and they throw mm. their kids in front of screens and tablets and yeah, yeah. you know uh just to and, and listen my wife and i battle with this constantly all three of our kids have those little amazon fire tablets and these kids get addicted to those things and so we put time limits on it mm -hmm. and we say no you can only have it for this amount of time um perfect example i've got my boys are home. They're, they're homeschooled. We homeschool them. And so right now while we're on this podcast, I need them to be quiet. So I give them their tablets and stuck them in their room. And then I'm gonna take them away when we're done. Right. <laughs> um, and so, but they're convenient. And so sometimes as a parent, I want to abuse that and just be like, here, stick my kids in front of that. Um, but one, I think you care. That's, that's awesome. Um, two, you know, just working on yourself 
first because you know you being a caring loving kind father is going to help your daughter whether you realize it or not is going to shape the kind of man she's going to look for which that's really weighty for me i'm like oh yes. crap you know? same here absolutely um, it, that's that's a really big weight and then number three is i think apologize often acknowledge mm. your mistakes to your kids because you're teaching them to take ownership you're showing them that you're not perfect and you're showing them there's a way to make restitution in the world for when you when you mess up um and so that removes some of the pressure because i don't want my kids to have this image that daddy's got it all figured out because i don't correct so they so they yeah. need to see they need to hear when i've messed up right when when i get irritated and i just um you know, and I, and I just snap at them because for the thousandth time they've left their bikes in the yard and toys are scattered <laughs> everywhere. Instead of taking a moment to disciple them and say, hey, you know, um, you know, we take our kids through the catechism. We have family worship every night. And, you know, so I could I could take that time and say, hey, Eliana, is leaving your stuff outside in the rain? God says we're supposed to take care of our things, have dominion. Is that a good way to take care of your stuff? Um, does it show respect for mommy and daddy since they spent a lot of money on that? Is that, mm. and so instead of taking that, that takes time though, right. And it's inconvenient. I'm trying to read a book or I'm trying to work out in my garage or I'm trying to cut the grass or whatever it is I'm trying to do. And so often it's tempting for us parents to just see our kids as kind of a distraction in our life. And I think just taking moments of being intentional and using that time to just walk them through and then. And then when, when you screw up and you do just snap at them because you're irritated, just come back and say, hey, daddy shouldn't have talked to you like that. I was irritated and tired. You know how you get grumpy sometimes with your brother and you like, you hit him, <laughs> uh, you know? And so then you can relate. I think that was huge because I, I look back at my life and a lot of people, you know, people don't like spanking, whatever. I was spanked and I understand a lot of people do it wrong. I think if there was ever a way to do it, my dad just did it about perfectly. Mm. So in our house, if I did something stupid that deserved a spanking, he would send me to my room. And, he, and oftentimes I'd be there for like 30, 40 minutes while he's kind of getting his head right. And I can honestly say he's never smacked me out of anger ever. So he would come in after he's cooled down. He always had a Bible with him. He would explain why, why is he using physical discipline? And then he would spank me for whatever I did. And then he would always say, I love you and I forgive you. We don't need to bring this up again. Give me a hug, walk out the door. And so I always felt like, you know, if you're going to do it, that's the way to do it. I was never hit out of anger. His discipline was severe, but it shaped me and it made me realize like, okay, I can go to him when I screw up. He's not punishing me out of rage. He's disciplining me to shape me into a, a type of person that he thinks I ought to be. So Whew, parenting's hard, man, because it reveals all the all the shortcomings in us, right? And mm. I think it's just intentionality and and acknowledging that, and you know, um, doing our best and and praying over our kids, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Parenting is hard. It's a every day. It's an exercise in self reflection and self awareness, and it's a. Man, it's an indescribable feeling. I was trying, I was having this conversation with uh, Katie Arrington. She, she yeah. was Trump's DOD um, chief intelligence uh, officer, and she ran for Congress here in South Carolina. I had her on the show recently, and I was telling her, before I had a kid, I, I thought I knew what life was about, right? Like I owned, I owned and sold a company. I'd done all this cool stuff, and then I had a kid, <laughs> and it was like a slap in the face. Like, dude, you didn't know anything about anything. This right. is what life is all about. And ever since then, it's like I every day I'm trying to navigate some new problem, figure something out. And, you know, I had parents who were not like your father. Right. Like they were they were actually abusive. They were drug addicts and abuse, even just t terrible parents. Right. And so I always think about that almost overanalyze it. Right. Like, am yep. I being too harsh? Am I being too sure. disciplinary and am i you know because my my daughter is a, like she's five if i raise my voice slightly i can make her cry <laughs> you know like she's yep because especially because my wife is this tiny sweet little asian woman and so the juxtaposition between me and my wife is so extreme right it's like sure. if dad raises his voice it's like holy crap you know and so and then so i'll raise my voice sometimes about something like she 
drew on the couch with a permanent marker. Right. And, <laughs> yes. you know, it's like, been there. yeah. Uh, but, and then she just cries and I feel terrible. Right. I didn't do a thing physically or anything, but I just raised my voice and it's like, then I have to have that conversation with myself and say, no, that you are shaping her into who she needs That's to right. become. She won't do this again. It's very unlikely that she'll do this oh. again. You know, it, it's the, it's the worst too. And you see the disappointment in their eyes and, mm. you know, no, no father, no good father wants to hurt their kids. Mm-mm. And the act of discipline is bringing about intentional discomfort. It's supposed to hurt. Yes. If it doesn't hurt, if it doesn't cause a measure of inconvenience, there's no reason for them to, to stop that thing again. Right. Well, it's pain uh, now versus pain later, right? If you don't correct. now, they're going to get out in the world and get chewed up and spat out. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you're, you're, uh, the, I was talking to my dad the other day. Cause I still, I call my dad sometimes for wisdom when I'm like, Hey, uh, That's beautiful. Well, how did you, how did you deal with X, Y, and Z when I was little or my sister? Right. Because, um, like here's how here's what I'm going through with Eliana and sometimes I feel like I'm beating my head against a wall and what do I do and you know, one of the things he said to me last week was you are not raising children you are raising adults mm. <laughs> and it's just a little perspective shift and then and just thinking about that phrase you know the most important thing that you and I might ever accomplish in our life might not actually be something we do it could be someone we raise <laughs> yes so which yes. is more weight more weight on top of it but I think that vulnerability piece and that honesty um, and the older they get to you, can, my daughter's nine and uh, you know, so she's kind of, she's going to be 10 here in February. So we're, we're kind of moving out of that spanking stage. I've gotten creative with the disciplines now. Now it's either, you know, grounding her, taking her pad from her certain privileges, right, or right. I get really creative and um, I made her, uh, she had to write 500 sentences because she's, she went through a period where she was lying. <laughs> and so I had a scripture passage on that. I'm like, you're memorizing this one, child, you know, yeah, write this sucker yeah. out. She spent like three days writing sentences. <laughs> and, uh, and so I have talks with her already now, like, Hey, why is daddy doing this? You know, you realize daddy's not doing these things to be mean to you but because I want to shape you into to somebody with character and discipline. And so, um, I think just being vulnerable, you know, I, but I think the apology is the biggest thing. See, my mom grew up in a very abusive home and, uh, and so she had a temper and, uh, this is why early on in my parents' marriage, so I'm, I'm adopted. My dad adopted me when he married my mom and he realized that because of her temper and the abuse that she endured, she did not need to handle the discipline in her home. So if I was in trouble with mom, she just, the rule was mom didn't deal with it. Dad will, when he gets home. Mm. And so when I was young, I remember my mom would say things that were degrading, um, she hit me a time or two, but what, but my mom just passed away two months ago and I, and I couldn't possibly have more honor and respect for her, not because she was perfect, but because over the last, you know, 35 years of my life, I watched her go to counseling. I watched her heal and I watched her change and I watched her repeatedly apologize to me every time she screwed up. And it wasn't that she ever got perfect. My mom was a fiery woman. Um, But I could see the trajectory of when she apologized, she meant it and she worked towards change. And though she may have stumbled a time or two in the future, it always looked different and she was quick to acknowledge she was wrong. And that gives me a lot of hope going, hey, man, I don't need to be perfect with my kids. Uh, I just need to be honest. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. And I want to touch on one thing I think you brought up earlier, but it's so important to me that I take that. So. It's one thing to say no, because I said so. And it's another thing to say no, and here's why, right? Here is why we're doing this. I think that is so key, explaining to them. And like you said earlier, that takes time and that's inconvenient, et cetera. Or at least it seems as such in our modern day era of constant distractions that, you know, you go to a restaurant, parents are on their phone, their kids just sitting there, you know, hey, please pay attention to me. Um, but telling them why is is key instead of just saying, uh, no, it's because I'm the I'm the parent and I said so. Like that's it's, such a yeah. cop out, you know. It is. It's tough because the, I do think at a at a young age they need to obey because they hear your voice and that sure. and it does sound and here's here, I'll give a good illustration of this. Um my son was screwing around, like walking towards the road. We live on a busy road. Mm. And 
I got furious with him, rightfully so, raised my voice and yelled at him because um, he went through a period where he was just obstinate. It's like, you couldn't get that boy to obey if you want. And so I needed him, <laughs> like I told him to move because there's a car coming. I said, get over here. And I don't have time to sit there and explain to you why you ought to obey me because we don't have that time because there's a truck coming down the road. And right, you need yeah. to know that I'm dad and I said to get your ass moving, move, right? But I agree with you. Like once, But then after the fact, you co- say, correct. look, the reason I yelled at you was. Yes, yeah, exactly, right. 100%. And so it's like, there's that both and. It's like you explain to them, yeah, you don't want to just, I mean, the, the Bible even says in, in Ephesians, um, not to provoke your children to wrath. And, you know, it, does, it also says to discipline them, but then it says, don't provoke them to wrath. So, you know, what's the easiest way to make a kid ticked off? Just obey because I said so. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's important, man. So, all right. I want to shift gears a little bit. You mentioned you homeschool. You are a full time coach, right? That's right. Is that that's what you do full time. So you're you work a lot, you own your own business, you have a lot of clients and you guys also manage pulling off the homeschooling thing. Talk a little bit about that dynamic because I think a lot of people are immediately like, I could never homeschool, I'm busy, I, you know, I have bills to pay, I, sure. I can't make this happen. That's tough and I, I really need to just give all the credit to my wife there because she shoulders 99% of that burden. Awesome. Um, she is a massage therapist, has her own massage therapy business and, um, and we keep that the hours there are pretty low, which is, which is good because that's what we want. So she's mm-hmm. here most of the time. Um, and she does pretty much all of the homeschooling, um, which is actually something I've been kind of thinking about that I need to take a little bit more of a role in. I love history and things like that. So that's my mm-hmm. world. Uh, yeah, yeah. Don't ask me to help with math. Seven <laughs> out of six people struggle with math and I'm one of them. <laughs> so, uh, you know, don't do that. But, um, but, so that dynamic is, is pretty simple there. I work from home, uh, you know, during COVID, I, I don't train people in person anymore. Um, occasionally I'll meet up with clients, but I ha- everything is online. So I am at this desk most of the day. And so it's great to be home. Now, my oldest daughter, she does go to a private school. We sent her to a Christian school across town. Um, and then my boys are at home. And that's largely some of the A, she's getting older and B, personality. Mm-hmm. Um in structure, I do, you know, I think schooling as an idea of going in and sitting down for eight hours a day for a little boy is a disaster. <laughs> like, it's just not, that's not how it works. Um, my daughter, she can do it. And girls are a little bit more predisposed to that. And she's very social and loves her friend network and all that. So it works out well for her. So she goes to a, a Christian school in town here, and then we keep the boys at home. Got it. Okay. So how many coaching clients do you have right now? I hover uh, between 90 and 100 usually. Really? Wow. And I've so, stayed there. I've stayed there for the, like the last two years. Yeah. So can you, for those listening, I'm sure a lot of guys are, maybe have aspirations to coach or, or have a career in fitness, sure. build their own business. Can you talk a little bit about the evolution of that? How, how you got to where you, I mean, you're working full time from home, supporting a family as a coach. Yep. How, how do you get there? for maybe yeah. a young guy listening who wants to build a career that way. Sure. So um, <laughs> it's ironic. You posted that video uh, of a Starbucks worker. I actually uh, <laughs> was in operations for Starbucks for eight years um, oh. and when, when I was first married. And so I started, so my wife and I were first married and I started doing that because I was in grad school. I was getting my um, master's at Southern Seminary in Louisville. And they had full benefits at part-time, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm young and poor and need health insurance. And this is, again, at an era, this is like 2008, 2009, where if you, uh, if you just show up and try hard, you're going to be a manager like instantly, <laughs> which is exactly what happened to me. The bar is so low. If you just give any degree of effort, you're just instantly promoted. So, um, so I ended up learning a ton. And I was very blessed with some excellent mentors and leaders. Mm-hmm in that organization um and they had a lot of bad ones but i seemed to get all the good ones throughout my career and uh friendships i have to this day so i learned how to manage people hire and fire and took my store to um you know it was very successful got to um experience managing multiple locations and geez probably hired and fired hundreds of people you know managed 
the PL and every, everything that you could do to, from the business side. Then I got recruited by Amazon to be um, a senior operations manager for their customer service wing. So I began to do that, did that for two years. That was interesting because it was the first time in my life where I was going to a situation where I was immediately responsible for over 200 people. And I wasn't leading from a place of subject matter expertise anymore. I was leading from um, a place where I had to develop relationships and gain influence. And so that was good for me to learn that. And then Amazon, going from Starbucks to tech company, I had no experience in. But I learned is leadership is leadership is leadership. Doesn't matter where you're at. If you understand how to build relationships, and influence people, you can lead effectively anywhere. So I spent two years at Amazon and it was great because they were very heavy on making decisions with data, okay? Anytime that I was in charge of a project and I came forward with a proposal, I had to have a ton of supporting data before I would get anything rubber stamped because the projects we were working on would have, you know, $30 million ramifications. And so, um, so I learned a ton there about making decisions with data. So naturally, when I switched over to my business full time, um, I had a lot of the groundwork that you don't get if you go to school for exercise science, if you go to school for kinesiology. A lot of these people come out of these schools or they have expertise just because maybe they are a good bodybuilder, powerlifter, whatever the case might be, but they've never run a business. They've never led people. They have no idea about systems and processes and all of these things that I have had over a decade of experience that I just kind of naturally flowed into my business. Now, I started coaching part-time in like 2014 when I was coming up in Strongman, which was just a hobby of mine. I'm still working in the corporate world. I went pro in 2019. And um, naturally, when I went pro, my inquiries just exploded, which I didn't learn anything magically more by going pro, right? It's just, that's the nature of humanity. It's how it works. Oh, he's a pro. Therefore, he, you know, yeah. has some level of expertise. So, um, so I got a lot of clients then. I was actually working for Amazon. And the full story is, I, I wish that I could say I had a ton of courage and just went out on my own. But actually, in 2018, I was a senior operations manager, and uh, there were six of us on the campus there in Winchester, Kentucky. We were required to do a community service thing. But the problem is, it wasn't community service. I can serve anybody. It was, I had to go participate at a pride rally. And my personal convictions, I wasn't going to do it. I said, hey, listen, if we're, I can serve anybody. If we're painting a building if we're raking leaves, I don't care who owns the house, gay, lesbian, straight, doesn't matter to me. If you're asking me to go and participate in something that is clearly a blanket endorsement, I personally am not doing it. I'll serve, but I won't endorse. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, in our world, we don't want tolerance anymore. We need wholesale endorsement. So um, because I was a leader, that went up the chain of command really fast. I ended up getting terminated. Now, thankfully, my boss was awesome. He thought it was absolutely ridiculous. He was, uh, he, he understood my position and thought it was absolutely dumb that I was being terminated. So he was supposed to terminate me, but when he did, he, uh, he gave me six months full severance. Wow. So I had six months of insurance and full salary from Amazon to go all in on my business. And my business was already growing. I was up to like 30 clients. I was bringing in a decent amount kind of on the side as a side hustle. And so I just said, Hey, I've got I've got uh, six months of full severance. We're going to put the hammer down. And I just, I just started going after it. But I think the reason that I was able to grow as quickly as I was, it, it did help that I was successful in Strongman. But just also that other experience that I mentioned, when it came to just basic stuff of how to run a business and how to lead people, I'd been doing that forever. I just translated it over to something I was passionate about. And so it was just kind of organic and natural. And I do mentor some up and coming coaches as kind of a one off service. And a lot of people put all their effort into technical knowledge, which is good. Always be bettering your craft. Continuing education is critical. But at the end of the day, it's your relationship with people. Mm -hmm. I can write the best plan in the world for you. But if I don't have your trust and buy-in and you're executing at 50%, it doesn't matter. But if I write a trash plan, but I've... I've got your trust, you're bought in, you have self-belief, you've got a clear vision for where we're going and you're applying 100% effort, you're gonna get better results. 
So don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying it doesn't matter if you're good at your job. You have to get results. So yes, be bettering yourself at your craft. I think too many people though are constantly nerding out over the intricacies of um, programming and all of these other things. And then they're just neglecting their relationships with their people. Like, I can't tell you how many times I get clients because like, yeah, I would, I would message my coach and I wouldn't hear back for three or four days. Right. Like how, this is basic customer service. Like my standard is you'll always hear back from me within 24 hours, Monday through Friday. Um, and it's usually faster than that. And I usually check on the weekends too. I just don't promise that I set boundaries so that I can have family time. Um, but like, this is basic. And so, you know, my average client retention right now is just shy of three years. So that's a big thing too, is so I do try to once a week, I'll say, hey, I've got coaching spots available. I'll throw out a little advertisement, but I don't have to often simply because I'm getting word of mouth clients and my clients are staying. So, you know, that's, I'm not in this constant like desperation to get more people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What does your, your typical day look like? Mm. Well, I don't really have a typical day anymore. So for example, I'll tell you about what I did today. Um, it depends on what I have going on in the day, right? So I knew I was going to talk with you and I've got a few other client uh, calls in the afternoon. So I got up this morning at four o'clock, read my Bible for 20 minutes, hit the gym, got a nice chest and tricep workout, got home, took my daughter to school, came back, had breakfast with my wife, um, talked with her for a little bit. She started homeschooling the boys. I smoked a cigar and read a couple chapters in a book I'm working on, podcasting with you. And then uh, when I'm done here, I will spend a few hours um, just doing client check-ins, right? So I have my client check-ins spread out throughout the week, right? So if I have 100 clients, I'm doing like, I'll do 25 a day, Monday through Thursday, and free up Friday for just putting out other fires or doing other things, right? Or program updates or whatnot. Um, so I'll knock through a bunch of those emails. And so it really just depends what, what I've got going on in a given day. It, it varies a little bit, okay. but I'm training jujitsu in there. I'm training at the gym. My daughter does jujitsu. So nice. we're running around all over the place. Yeah, that's cool, man. That's awesome. I just wanted to kind of paint a, a picture for, I always think about young men when I, especially when I interview men like yourself, because I think there's a lot of curiosity there and people love the, what's the best way to put this? There's a romantize romantization of being an entrepreneur of working for yourself. And, and, you know, there's definitely some amazing attributes or aspects sure. of it rather, but also I think, you know, young people need to realize it's not all sunshine and rainbows, right? Mm. Like you're doing, you're doing 25 check-ins a day for four yeah. days in a row. That is not a light workload. No. And I would also say too, I have my business down now to a incredible efficiency that took a long time to perfect. And again, it's predicated on 10 years in the corporate world. Mm -hmm. understanding you know everything that we did at both amazon and starbucks was lean six sigma waste elimination so i have a process the second somebody reaches out to me on instagram i have an exact or email i have an exact process for what is this going to look like how do i do that interaction i know how much time it's going to take me so mm -hmm. you know for example i track data on everything everything so if someone reaches out to me and says hey what are your coaching costs. I know immediately that person's not invested, right? Because they're shopping around for the cheapest price point versus going, hey, I want to work with this person because I have goals to achieve, whatever else. It just tells me something about their mindset. So in that case, I have a little blurb that I already have saved on my notes app. I'll back it out, put their name. Hey, so-and-so, thanks for reaching out. Bloop, send that off. It takes me 10 seconds with all of my information and all that. And the chances, the, the statistical chance that they will become a client is around 48%. If someone reaches out and says, hey, um, you know, I really wanted to learn more about your coaching services. I'm interested in X, Y, and Z. I'll shoot them a message back and say, hey, do you have five minutes to get on a, uh, a video chat real quick? And if they do, cool. If, uh, if not, then I'll shoot them a voice memo. Here's the thing. If I can, get, if I can look somebody in the eye when they're inquiring, it's 98% chance they'll be a client. Because there's that human connection piece. And when you think about it, when you're reaching out, to ask for help uh, in this arena, unless you're an athlete or something, if you say you're a soccer mom that needs to lose 30 pounds, um, there's a level of vulnerability. You're basically saying, hey, I need help 
because something's broken. I don't know how to fix it. And I've tried and it's not working. There's, there's a level of vulnerability and coaches are a dime a dozen. So if they can see a smiling face, have some reassurance and stuff right away, then, you know, I can connect with them. They're going to convert. If I can't connect face to face, voice messages are the second best thing. It's about 80% conversion because they can at least hear tone uh, come through in the voice that they can't necessarily read in a text. So little things like that, that no one is teaching. People can graduate with a degree in exercise science and have no idea about leadership, about any of this sort of stuff, right? And so um, I think it's all those intangibles that stacked up to to help kind of help me take off. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. And it's so true that and I, and this isn't even limited to the fitness space. I, I think in general, we, we sort of, for whatever reason, just glance by the most important aspects of business, which are human interactions, as you've alluded to several times, right? It's like, just like in high school, they don't teach you personal finance, which is absolutely preposterous, right? Right. For whatever reason, all of these, and I went to college for the, uh, a scientific discipline. So I... I studied biochem for undergrad, biochem for grad school, and I basically learned everything on the job working in corporate America as a scientific recruiter. But when I first entered that space, thank God I had some people skills just naturally because sure. so many people from my program, if they had jumped in and just tried to start cold calling uh, scientists to recruit for our different clients, man, they would have, it would have been awful. Right. And right. so I, I appreciate your perspective on that. And I think it's so true. And especially you know, I used to own a chain of restaurants. And so I've hired a bunch of people in their early to mid twenties, man. And it's, it's so clear, at least as far as what I've noticed, we, we are trending in a direction. And I think technology is partially to blame for this. We're trending in a, in a direction that I don't like where interhuman interaction is suffering and eye contact and, and things like this that are just Things that, you know, we, you and I, how old are you again? 35. 35. We're the exact same age. You know, the, we have the benefit of growing up in an era where we got to sort of see both worlds. And in our yes. formative years, human interaction was still a thing, right? Correct. Dude, I will try to talk to like 16, 17, 18 year old guys here in the gym or whatever. Uh, even if they approach me and they're like, hey, I, I love your content. I'm a huge fan. Most of the time, they won't even look me in the eye. Right. right. And I think that for anyone listening, because we always try to tie it back to that, what are the lessons you can take out of these conversations, man? You've got to hone those skills. That yes. alone will set you apart so far from the competition in a free market. You know, just look at Anthony and, and what he's achieved to all the listeners. Like just being able to speak with people and connect with people on a human level is so important. Yeah, you know, it, it goes back to as a child, I'm thankful that my dad pushed me into to things that were uncomfortable for me. I remember yes. one time he made me do a, sing a solo in church when I was seven. And I remember <laughs> bawling my eyes out. I cannot get up there in front of these people. And dad is like, you're going to do it. And he made me do it. And he pushed me to do things that were hard. And so I look back now and I go, oh, yeah, all the times he taught me about how to shake someone's hand firmly and look them in the eye. I take that yes. for granted. And nowadays, these are things that are completely lost. And it's like, that bar is so low. Like, this is all we have to do is smile, say please and thank you, give a firm handshake, look something in the eye, hold the door. You know, you might be accused of uh, being a, a chauvinist if you hold the door. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it, it's the bar is really, it's never been lower for success right now. Yeah, well, look at like Chick Fil A, for example, man. Just they've managed to set themselves apart by such an order of magnitude, in part because they have mastered systems and processes, which yes, they we have. also spoke about. But also, every single person there, and they're young people. They they cultivate this in people, and I think it's in no small part, of course, due to uh, their religious uh, and and moral um, viewpoint. But it's eye contact. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am my pleasure, all this stuff. And it's just like such a breath of fresh air, especially when you're going into on the rare occasion that I do, I'm kind of admitting uh, to my faults here, but when I get some <laughs> fast food, right? Like 
it's such a different experience. Sure. You go like if I see a long line at Chick Fil A, it doesn't dissuade me from going whatsoever. Correct. I, I know they're going to move me through fast. They're going to be polite. It's going to be an awesome experience. And that human connection that they've created along with systems and processes. So really a mirror image of kind of what you've done in your coaching business. That is the ultimate combination that makes me say, I'll go, I'll go to that long line at Chick-fil-A before I'll go to this place over here with no weight, because I know it's still going to be a better experience. That's right. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. They, man, so I true. mean, they're so successful. They could be closed on an entire day of the week and still be crushing other fast food chains. And I love that they've held fast to that as well. Right. You know? Absolutely. To, to open and, and it's, it's, go. it's encouraging to see people with integrity and it's sad that they're viewed as, as hateful because, you know, in this day and age, disagreement is hate. And it's like, no, it's disagreement. It's not hate. I mean, the, the word hate literally means to wish that somebody was dead. I don't wish anybody was dead. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. I have a disagreement. We, we disagree on worldview and lifestyle, but I don't hate you. But uh, unfortunately, you're, we're not we're not talking with reasonable people anymore. So, no, that's a, a big part of it, man. And that's something I wanted to touch on with you, too, because I obviously follow you on social media and you are you don't shy away from difficult exchanges on social. You don't shy away from expressing your viewpoints. I hear often because I'm the same way and I've had some stuff that, you know, got me. I've, I've had people say some mean things to me, you know, I've had death sure. threats and all that fun stuff. And uh, again, young guys who feel so up against it in terms of being told that masculinity is toxic and all this other crap, they, I hear from them all the time. They're like, what, how do I, I admire the fact that you speak up. Do you have any advice to me? And I'm like, man, you just got to speak up. Like you, you, you just have to do it. There's really no secret to it. You, mm -hmm. you have to believe enough in what you're standing for to just speak up and know that you morally are operating from the right place. And, and that's sure. kind of what I tell them. I was curious from your perspective as someone who also, and yes. I mean, you you, you even sort of take on the, the battle of, uh, within Christianity, right. talking about the, the people who sort of, um, espouse this watered down version versus, right. you know, what, what you advocate, you're not, you don't shy away from that either. So could you put a little color on that? Like, yeah. what is, what is your, what would your advice be to young people who grapple with that? Because dude, you know how it is when you're young, you're afraid of not being cool or losing friends or, you know, yep. if, if it's the end of the world or, or whatever, if you don't, well, that's, that's right just table. it. You, you, you gotta, you gotta not care about that. Like, like, some people say, you know, they've asked me, does you being so um, <laughs> opinionated in your face, whatever you want to use, does that hurt your coaching business? Not a chance. I mean, yes. Does it drive some people away? I'm sure it does. Um, I lose followers whenever I make certain types of posts, right? I'm on my third Instagram account. My first one was close to 30,000 followers. You know, I'm now down to my third Instagram account and it's okay. Um, but it also is going to draw other people to you, the right kind mm -hmm. of people that you, that, that are like-minded and things like that. So understand that piece, but then my, I'm trying to get better at this. What I try to do is when I attack something um, viciously, I will attack an idea. Okay. But I have a, a lot person. of, yes. Now, unfortunately, like, like this would be a recognized distinction, even 50 years ago, it's not anymore. To attack an idea now is to attack somebody themselves. So if you attack homosexuality, you are attacking all gay people and you are attacking the individual gay person that feeds that. And now you hate me and you're oppressive and all this. Um, and I can't get around that. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna um, cater to it. I just don't care at this point. But my goal is when I say something about a thing, I'm gonna attack that thing broadly. But when I'm addressing somebody in person, um, I'm going to be a lot more careful, not because I, not because I don't believe what I believe. Oh, I'm going to say it, but I'm going to, I'm going to cater it to that person as a person. I have friends who are atheists. I have friends, I have like five or six lesbian clients and they're great people. And we could not possibly disagree more on certain things. And, um, but, but I like them as people and we have this transactional free market thing going on where I'm helping them get in shape and they're, and so it's, so it's all good because they're grown adults um, and it's great. 
So I have a friend here in Lancaster who is is as atheistic as they come. And he and I will sit down over cigars and we'll like hash through all this stuff and we'll debate, but we're good friends. And at the end of the day, I go, man, he's a dad and he has a little girl and he wants her to prosper and thrive. And we have different ways of seeing the world. So when I attack an idea, I'm going to attack it with him, but I'm not going to um, excrete his character. Right. You know, I'm going to treat, the goal is when it comes to truth, I want to be a lion for truth and, and a lamb in person. And that doesn't mean weak. That just means, um, I do want to be approachable and kind. I'm not going to back down, but you know, if, if I am sitting across the table, I'm going to sit across the table and share a drink with a trans person. My cousin's trans. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to agree and I'm not going to cater to their beliefs and I'm not going to acknowledge them by their pronouns. I'm also not going to go out of the way to harm them intentionally to be mean and be like calling them groomer and everything else like this. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's just, uh, that's kind of one of the distinctions I try to make is like, if I'm attacking something broadly, you know, I'll bring down fire and brimstone, but on an individual basis, I'm going to try to look at them through the lens of humanity and um, not going to back down from my views, but I'm going to try to understand where they're at and tailor that discussion to them, if that makes sense. Yeah. I don't care if somebody is offended by the content of my belief. But if I'm dealing with you in person, my person ought not be offensive. I could buy you a drink. I could sit down and share a meal with you. I can shake your hand. I can hold the door for you and I can wish you a good night. Those are polite human interactions. I'm not going to be a jerk and, you know, spit in your food and all these things. That's just rude. <laughs> right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's great advice, man. And especially, you know, the first part where you said that you have maybe had some people unfollow you, but you haven't lost a lot of clients, right? Because w yeah. what I've noticed is, and for those worried, first off, if you're worried about losing friends over your beliefs, they're not friends anymore. Correct. Right. The, and that's so important. I can't stress that enough, especially again, young people, especially because I remember being young and worrying about this and that and the other, and, oh, maybe wh whatever, you know, this, the dumb yep. stuff we go through as young people. Um, but what I have found once I finally, I was kind of thrust into speaking out at first, went viral and then just said, screw it. And, you know, I'm now I, I don't care. I'll, I'll talk about anything. What I found is, and I was talking actually to Andy um, Frisella about this a few weeks ago, and I'm so thankful for it because it's allowed those of us who do speak up and share the same values to essentially find one another. Yes. And when you bond over things that are that deep, it's so much better than superficial relationships with people that you don't share uh, certain beliefs with or or don't see as, as being of your ilk. And as far as, you know, business goes, following goes, all that stuff, you know, the, to an extent, those metrics matter if you want to survive in life, right? Sure. If you're, if you're a business owner, all of that, man, it's... I'd much rather have a hundred percent like just the most deepest buy-in with 20% of the population instead of this just bland, disinterested, superficial sure. arrangement with everybody. Right. Absolutely. And that's what I've noticed. hundred percent. And when you stand in the middle of the road, you just get run over by both sides. Like that's all exactly that, that, that was a way more eloquent way of saying what I just blabbered, <laughs> blabbered on about. <laughs> Well, I wish I could take credit for it. I can't. I don't know who I heard that from, but yeah, but it's, it's so, so true. true, man. It's absolutely true. And if you own a business and you're afraid to speak up, like I guarantee you, if you do, you might take a little hit. There might be a little dip. I doubt there will be, but then what you'll notice is, I, I believe it's Simon Sinek talks about having um, a thousand raving fans, and that's really all you need to be hyper successful in any particular niche. Like people that are fully bought in. If you're selling it, they're buying it because they believe in what you're right. saying. And there are 350 million people in this country alone. Correct. You, know, you, you just speak truth. You'll sleep better at night. And the people you align yourselves with, those, those alignments will be so much deeper and forged in such a manner that your life will be so much more fulfilling. That's right. My, my Absolutely. And I can already anticipate some of the pushback, not from anybody that would 
follow you per se, but from a from a leftist crowd would be, you know, well, that's so tribal, right? That's so mm -hmm. tribalistic. And the reality is though, um, tribalism is is human nature. It doesn't mean that you dislike other tribes, but people gravitate towards like well, worldviews. Yeah. I'm not saying only associate with certain right. people. I'm I'm saying be honest about where you stand on things and correct who who gravitates towards you will will be people who generally and look man I have friends who are very much out of alignment with some some very important tenets to my beliefs and my worldview that are still they they acknowledge that we differ in those areas but like you said we can have a cigar we can hit a workout we can go fishing or, or whatever and um i'm not saying be tribal i'm saying sure. don't sacrifice honesty in your own beliefs yeah. for the sake of hoping to be a part of some other tribe and i'm with you and i'm basically saying i don't think tribalism is necessarily bad i think um it, mm. it's got a lot of bad light and things thrown on it um but it's kind of like the idea of stereotyping everybody thinks that stereotyping is is bad and mean and like stereotyping is a survival mechanism Oh, it's a wise thing to do. I mean, our military yeah. does it. We go overseas. We do it any day of the week. We're walking into the mall and I've got my family with me. I'm watching. And look, you know, perfect example. I'm a big jack dude with tattoos. Okay. So if I go into any grocery store and there's a little old lady, she's probably going to be a little nervous of me. And so I always try to overcompensate with kindness. How are you doing, man? Same. Yes, ma'am. Because I understand it. And I'm not mad if someone stereotypes me to be a certain way, because guess what? I chose to look this way, mm. right? So if you don't want to be stereotyped as X, Y, or Z, don't be that way, right? That's so offensive, you know? Well, whatever. Okay, you're offended. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Right, um, right. Yeah, no, it's it's true. And, and uh, same thing. You know, there are certain, I know that there are certain stereotypes of guys who look like me. Right. I acknowledge that and I take that into account with my everyday interactions with people. It is what it is, right? Because there are some guys who look like me who do fit whatever stereotype someone might have. So I understand sure. why they have that stereotype because it's of benefit to them in their day-to-day -day life. And, uh, you know, I, 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 my wife is, a, as I said earlier, a tiny Asian lady. And I joke around with her all the time about the stereotype of Asians being bad drivers. And guess what? <laughs> She's not the best driver. So it's like, <laughs> hey, my wife know. is from the South. You know, my dad's always teasing her, be, you know, about not wearing shoes and having missing teeth and all this, <laughs> you know, right? It's just, we joke around. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, exactly. you, you can tell where people's sacred cows are is when you can't joke around mm. about things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree, man. Well, hey, look, brother, that was uh, an hour that flew by. We definitely got to do it again, man. Absolutely. Um, it was fun. I, I appreciate your time. Um, I know you, you're a busy dude and you got a lot going on. So I'm, I'm honored that you shared an hour of your day with me. Where can everybody find you if they want to reach out about coaching or any other uh, thing that, that you might uh, offer yeah. the world? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, first off, thanks again for, for having me on. This was an absolute pleasure. Um, Instagram is kind of the main place where I share all my shenanigans. It's, I'm at coach underscore Anthony Deal. Um, I am on Twitter now that Elon bought it. We'll see how that goes at Anthony deal three. Um, and, uh, those are the two main places uh, okay. where you can, people can reach out. I do have a website, newvisionperformance.com, but Instagram is the main way to get a hold of me. Okay. So if someone's interested in, in coaching, for example, shoot you a DM on it. Yeah. Shoot me a DM. I, I have the, uh, I have the link tree there with the coaching forms and all that, but you just okay. shoot me a message. It's totally cool. fine. Right on. And for those listening, I mean, it'll be in the description and everything, but just for those listening, deal is D I E H L. You got it. All right, brother. Well, Hey man, I appreciate it for all my listeners out there. Thank you guys so much. I love you all. And until next time, keep your minds free.